Hello, welcome. Good evening. Uh, I'm Joseph Salvatore. I'm an associate professor of writing here at the New School, and it's my immense pleasure to welcome all of you this evening to a night of short fiction, literary conversation, and the awarding of the Story Prize. On behalf of the New School, I want to offer our congratulations to the three finalists and our gratitude to the Story Prizes Julie Lindsay, Larry Dark, and Melissa Alcott legendary champions all of the short story who work tirelessly every year to produce the smart and elegant event that we have in store for you this evening. It's an honor for the New School to have co-sponsored this extraordinary program with them for the past 15 years. I teach a course here at the New School on the craft and theory of fiction and every semester I marvel anew at the sheer power of the short story. In its compressed and concentrated form, it helps give shape and language and meaning to the often inexpressible experience of being alive in all its urgency and passion and drama. And so we're very, very grateful to have an evening devoted solely to the celebration of that singular art form, the short story. In a moment, I'll hand the evening over to tonight's host, Larry Dark. But first, please allow me to thank a few people here at the New School who helped make this evening possible. Thanks to Ben Fama, Whitney Kennerly, John Valdez Klinger, Brett Duquette, and especially Lori Lynn Turner. We also want to thank really useful media who will be filming tonight's event. And finally, let me announce that the books we are celebrating this evening are uh, for sale in the lobby, thanks to the fabulous independent booksellers, McNally Jackson. We have a full and exciting evening ahead, and I'm delighted to be sharing it with you. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming to the stage the director of the, short, the, director of the story prize, Larry Dark. Thank you, Joe, for that lovely introduction. You, you stole my thunder a little bit because I'm going to praise the short story also, but <laughs> I guess that's to be expected. Um, this is the 16th year of the Story Prize. In that time, I've read a lot of short story collections, and I'll admit that sometimes I feel like reading something else. <laughs> but how can you tire of a form that can move you, surprise you, inform you, help you understand what it's like to walk in someone else's shoes, gain a different perspective, encounter another mind, and entertain ideas that otherwise might never have entered your consciousness. True, other narrative forms can do many of these things, but I don't believe any of them do it as well as short stories do. Everything Inside by Edwidge Danticat, Sabrina and Karina by Kali Fajardo Anstein, and Stein, I'm sorry. Grand Union by Zadie Smith. These three collections are skillful, mindful, eye-opening, and enlightening in different and distinctive ways. Tonight, each reader will read from her work and have an onstage conversation with me. They'll read in alphabetical order by last name, just so you don't try to interpret why they're reading, what order they are. Uh, and it's also alphabetical order by first name, too, coincidentally. <laughs> at, at the end of the evening, Julie Lindsay will announce the winner, as chosen by our three judges, uh, Kristen Arnett, Andy Hunter, and Tiffany Yannick. Most importantly, this event honors each of these three amazing authors and each of these three outstanding events. Uh, in addition to thanking Joe, I'd like to thank our partner for 15 years, the New School Creative Writing Program and uh, especially the Chisholm Foundation, which supports the Story Prize and has for all of these years. The Story Prize Spotlight War Award honors an additional short story collection of exceptional merit, and this year's Spotlight Award winner is the Trojan War Museum by Aisha Papacha Bucek. Aisha, if you're here, can you please stand up? <laughs> the lights came on. <laughs> okay. Her book's for sale, too. And so is the uh, Story Prize Anthology. 
um, which we put out last year to celebrate the first 15 years of, of the award. Uh, recognition is also due to the other 90 writers whose books we read in 2019. We read 94 books. Uh, it's always difficult for Julie and me to choose a few out of the many, but writers like Aisha, Edwidge, Kali, and Zadie make it a little bit easier. Our first finalist, Edwidge Danticat, was the first ever winner of the Story Prize back in 2005 for The Dewbreaker. That year, that year only, our event was part of the selected short series at Symphony Space. In that format, we didn't get to hear her voice or talk to her about her work, so we're especially pleased that she is once again a finalist and that we'll get that opportunity this evening. Everything Inside is an apt title for a collection whose stories go beneath the surface, displaying tremendous empathy for flawed characters doing their best to navigate difficult personal circumstances. Through just the right details and sentence-level elegance, these stories draw you into their depths. I'm pleased to introduce Edwidge Danticat. Um, good evening. Thank you all for coming. It's an honor to be a finalist once again for the Sorry Prize and with um, Zadie and Kali to have my book named along with theirs. Um, I'm going to read from a story in the book called The Gift. Um, so in the story, two lovers, Thomas and Anika, reunite for dinner seven months after the January 12, 2010 earthquake in Haiti, which we just commemorated the 10th year anniversary of. Um, so in that earthquake, um, Thomas's wife um, and baby daughter were killed. Anika is an artist, and here she's contemplating how to deal with loss through both art and ritual. So from the gift. Pusan Paweyu. Anika started sketching million-year-old birds because she couldn't imagine how to sketch or paint what she really wanted to, earthquakes. Her sketches were meant to be studies for paintings, but she got no further than that. When you paint an earthquake, do you paint soil monsters devouring the earth, shattered houses, bloody, lifeless bodies, random personal items, t-shirts, dresses, shoes, air combs, and toothbrushes scattered above the rubble? Do you paint cemeteries and grave markers and distort mourners weeping over them? Do you paint crosses, wilted, dust-covered flowers, or vibrant, bright red ones for hope? Do you write messages on your canvas in case anyone misses the point? Or do you sketch your lover, his dead wife, and their dead baby daughter? A derivative, photorealistic work based on an online image, something so faithful to the original that it could easily be mistaken for it. Except in your sketches, their high-end designer clothes become feathers, and apart from their legs and faces, they become birds. Now she could also paint a man stuffing his face while regretting having come to a dinner he had long put off. Where were you all this time, she finally asked him, in case he or she got up at any point in the evening and fled. You said you'd tell me tonight. During their first phone calls a few days before, he told her that she could ask him everything she wanted to at dinner. Pushing the food aside, he chuckled nervously, then said, physical rehab, where I still go. In a nut house. I spent time in a nut house. A psychiatric hospital? We have a winner. He raised his hands up in the air and cheered sarcastically. I'm sorry, she said, I didn't know. She reached for his back, he pulled away. You weren't meant to know, he said. No one was meant to know. When his assistant told her he was doing therapy somewhere and didn't want to talk to anyone, she thought about the amputated leg, the prosthesis. She hadn't considered his mind that he'd be so broken that he would also need this other kind of help. Some guys I knew in Port-au-Prince, he said, as he reached for more food, their bodies were found crushed together with their mistresses in hotel rooms. How would it have looked if my wife and child were pulled out in pieces from under her parents' house? 
I'm taken out from under the house alive, and I continue this thing with you? That's the bargain he'd made over the hours of waiting, with whichever gods had heard their breaths grow more and more shallow alongside him, he said. And when nighttime came, and when the aftershocks continued, and when both his wife and daughter fell silent in the dark, he swore that if he, were, if he were spared and didn't die, he would never speak to Anika again. She picked up her wine glass and tried to picture some ghostly and shadowy version of this, of his leg crushed beneath one of the house beams, of his wife and daughter at first screaming for help, then losing blood, strength, hope, then breath. Then she saw the people who had been digging for the three of them, finding only him alive, barely alive, as his assistant had said. So how would it look if after all that, I kept sleeping with you, he repeated. How would it look, she said, before stopping herself from saying more. Did he think that theirs was ever a moral love? Otherwise, how could she explain the initial twinge of delight she'd felt when she'd learned that his wife and daughter had died? Was it actually glee she'd felt or was it another version of the fantasy she's nurtured for nearly a year of his wife and child disappearing, allowing her to take their place? I wasn't ever going to leave them for you, he said, as if responding to her thoughts. He turned his face towards the Brickle Causeway and the glass towers and skyscrapers whose reflections created, as the night sky darkened, a parallel city on the water. And you were not the only one, he added, his voice growing colder as he went along. I think you should know that there were other women. She tried to speak, but her own voice cracked and the sound fell back in her throat. Aside from being relieved that he was still alive, what she was feeling most was shame. The night of the earthquake at the college hall where she and a group of her students had gathered, one of the students, a singer, Ruo, asked if anyone happened to have a rope. No one did, so some men offered their neckties and a few women their scarves. Roro asked for help in tying the ties and a few scarves together until they formed a table-sized cloth circle in the middle of the room. This is now the epicenter of the earthquake, Roro said, and we are going to fill it with our love. This was not exactly what she'd wanted or needed, and nearly everyone seemed as disappointed as she was that Roe had not provided them with a more meaningful ritual, with unique and specific prayers, hymns or psalms to recite, or soothing refrains to chant. This was supposed to be their spontaneous porta fidea, their transient door of faith, their sudden sanctuary. This thing with the epicenter ties and scarves felt trite to her, empty, untrue. But it was their incantation of the moment until some more ancient ceremonies could be recalled and detailed or newer ones devised. Another type of priest, cantor, vicar, or layperson might have performed a different ritual, but the basic idea would have been the same, to try with will and desire alone to influence something you could not. Roa then brought out a bottle of Haitian rum, and while pouring it in the middle of the circle, made everyone recite over and over, Pusan Paweyu, Pusan Paweyu. Anika too had joined in, mouthing, though not really wanting to, Pusan Paweyu, for those we do not see here, for those who are not here. Thank you. How are you doing? <laughs> that was the easy part, you know, yeah. the hard part. Yeah. Uh, when you, uh, I think this is the only book, the only story in this book that's about the earthquake. Mm -hmm. uh, did you set out to write a story specifically about that or did it evolve from the characters and, and their relationships? Um, initially, I mean, I think as the months went by soon after the earthquake, it felt it always felt too soon. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, I mean, it's, it's that thing where the reality is so big that it felt like 
putting in a story would, would um, shrink it somewhat. And so I, I tried to write a play about it. I felt mm -hmm. like that would be a way to bring it into one room. So, so that story started out as a, as a play. And um, you know, it's just one setting, and, and then just sort of evolved from there. What made you decide to change it from a play to a story? Um, because I'm not good at writing plays. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that made me realize. <laughs> yeah. so I, it, it's interesting because you're writing about the effects that are removed instead of writing about, you know, instead of putting the reader there mm -hmm. at the scene in the middle of it. And um, that must have been how you thought to approach it also. Yeah, I, because I really was thinking of the aftershocks, like the ripple effects of, of things, of different relationships, and, and, and sort of what's left of, the, of, of this catastrophe mm. on the body, on the spirit, and just people's really shifting. And, and the surprising things that, that you know, people feel that it had brought out of them. So that interested me um, very much, and sort of projecting sometimes onto tragedy, like your own small selfish desires. So that, that in, inside the character was very, uh, was something that I really wanted to explore. I, I noticed that in this book, a lot of the stories are centered around little Haiti in, in Miami. Um, and that's, we, you know, we read The Dewbreaker, that was a, mm -hmm. a story prize winner. And that was more, um, I guess, in different places, some in Florida, some yeah. in New York, some in Haiti. Yeah. But were you really thinking about trying to capture that neighborhood in particular, or did that just evolve organically? Well, it's strange because the, this is the first book in which I'm writing about a place where I actually am. Hmm. So it, it felt kind of like I was catching up with myself finally. Because when I, with my first book, I was writing about Haiti when I was in New York. And then the Dubriker, I was writing about New York when I was hmm. in Florida. <laughs> right. And so I'm, I'm finally caught up. Yeah. I mean, that's, the, yeah. that's sort of the, the, the thing of immigration and moving around to and, and it's interesting, it felt like a new experience to, to be able to write about a place and then drive by on the way to picking up your kids to right. school. <laughs> yeah. Does that feel more personal to you in some way than, than the other you know, books where you were kind of trailing your experience a little bit? Yeah, it feels, I mean, it, even the, it feels like this close in a way that, that is interesting because mm -hmm. it, I, the neighborhood I live in is gentrifying really quickly. And so actually the title of the book is from something I saw in a window of one of my neighbors. So it, the, it said, um, it was a sign that says, um, nothing inside is worth dying for. And I'm walking by, I'm like, what does that even mean? Yeah. And I, you know, I'm looking closer and then I realize there's a bullseye in the middle. And I thought, this is kind of silly. Like, you want the criminal to do like literary interpretation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, um, and, and it just seemed really silly. And then it's, and, and I decided, it was like, I, I was like, in my editing mode, I was like, it should say everything inside is worth dying for. And then it seemed kind of like, yeah. like the, it was saying something about immigration and sort of like the sacrifices people make. And so it ended up being everything inside. We started out with that whole thing on, mm -hmm. um, as a title. And my editor, Robin, who's there, she's like, that's too much for the, for, <laughs> for the cover. <laughs> so it ended up being everything inside. I was going to ask you about that because this is pretty unusual for a short story collection. There is no story called Everything Inside, but that's the title of the book. Yeah, that's, that's done on purpose. And yeah. we talked about that too because, you know, um, I, I said to Robin, if we have a story called Everything Inside is We're Dying For, some smart ass critic is going to say, no, not everything inside. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I didn't want that. <laughs> right. It's a title story. Yeah. yeah, I think that's that's interesting. Have you done that before? Without a title story? Yeah. Um, I had, like the Dewbreaker had one. Claire Vassila. Like, no, I don't think I haven't done yeah. that before. But I gave it much thought. I was like, I'm not. I don't want a title story this time. I always like that. I think it's kind of fun because it's almost a puzzle for the reader. Like you, you look at the cover. You look at the contents page. Wait. That's not a, a story yeah. title, so it, it must have some overarching significance. And I th think you bring that with you mm -hmm. when you read a book. I do. I don't know if everybody would do that. Uh, how, how has you've, is this your third or fourth story collection? 
Um, it depends on how you read them. Yeah. Some like novel and stories. Right, the right. other is that this was more like we. I really ha after come like the Dubuque Row, which was sort of li linked um, mm. in Claire of the Sea Light. I really wanted this to seem like I mean individual stories, but I I wanted them also to f to feel connected in mm. some way, like to to have a kind of movement. So, like they're, they're moving towards something that, even though the characters aren't the same, or you don't have reoccurring characters like in some of the other books, but that you still feel a kind of unity. And how 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 has your writing changed? Has it changed since you first started writing stories? Is there anything that you've um, that you do differently than than maybe you did before? Well, I, I hope it's changed because I yeah. I started writing so I could crack a lot of the stories I wrote when I was in college, mm -hmm. and I think what's changed is that I'm a little more patient with um, with the story. Like I mean, part of it is also the other obligations in my life. With like if I have an idea, it's not like I can get to it always immediately, but I I trust that I trust more that something will come, and and so I I feel like I have a lot more patience with letting the story unfold, letting the characters kind of show me who they are. And so before I, I, was, I was more, when I had more time too, I was more of a binge writer. You know, it's right. kind of like, I have to get it out in three days and I won't sleep and I, I, I can't do that <laughs> anymore. But, and I, and I think for the better because you kind of, it, it, you go deeper. I, I noticed something which is, and, and maybe I'm just comparing it to the Dew Breaker, which I know best next to this, but uh, the Dewbreaker was a bad guy. There were bad guys in this book, in that book. This one, there are people who do bad things, but I never felt like they were bad people. Mm -hmm. I don't know, is that something that you thought about? Well, I think also, I mean, as, I, as you get older, you realize mm -hmm. the complexity of people. I mean, I had a, a very uh, ex interesting experience with the Dewbreaker where I was uh, at a signing one time, and, and a gentleman came up who's, who he looked like, you know, the dewbreaker for this adult. It's a, it's a, was a torturer in, in Haiti during the uh, Duvalier dictatorship. Uh, you know, like we call her Shuket Lawizi, which is translated as dewbreaker. And the gentleman came up to at, at a reading, and it almost like I almost was frightened because he looked so much mm -hmm. like out of, of central casting. And he said, you know, he said I. And now he was doing soccer clubs for kids in Haiti, and he said, I want you to know we had no choice. And he was almost tearful. He was like, you know, he's like, if you were, if you were told to kill someone and you didn't do it, you would be killed. And, and so that, that to me, then, then I, you know, you don't even need that kind of experience to, to understand the, the, how people are complex, right. but, but that definitely adds to it. And there was, once I was in a school with, um, and I, that's what inspired the first story in that book. There was a, a girl who's like, "Mon papa était un militaire." Like my father was in the military, and I'm, and and then she starts telling like who her papa is, and and I'm just not trying to to like show on my face, like, right. and and then you realize like to her it was her father. He was like, and she loved him. She was proud that you know he's Haitian, you're Haitian, and then it, but I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Ton papa était vraiment un militaire, you know. He was really like, but but she she adored him, you know. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think that does show in this collection that that you do have. I'm sure you had empathy before, but it's uh, more at the center, I think. Mm -hmm. For instance, there's a story where um, a man, you know, rips off. And, and his girlfriend rip off, you know, his ex-girlfriend. They come up with this whole story for why they need money, but they never seem that horrible to me. Mm -hmm. uh, did you feel that way about them, or, or were they meant to be? Oh, I hated them. Yeah. But <laughs> because because I I'm, I know people like them, mm. but I mean, what I wanted to to show was their motivation. Like, why would? And I think we ask whether they're their do breakers or that we we often ask ourselves how could people do that how could they be like that and 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 in many cases they have a, a reason that they is perfectly justifiable to them right you know that they think it's perfectly proper and and so that's I that kind of space and thinking and fiction interests me very much uh, when you uh, when you're writing a story when it you're starting a new collection. Are you thinking about it in terms of a collection, or are you just 
writing stories, and at a certain point, you realize you're moving toward that. Yeah, I'm usually, I'm usually just writing a story mm -hmm. to procrastinate from longer work. Right. <laughs> Um, it's, you know, if you, because sometimes if you're working on a, a novel, it just feels like, oh, I'm never going to finish this. My kids are going to be in college and I won't <laughs> be done. And, and then you, when you write a story, you, you know, sort of get that like, bit of satisfaction early on. So I'm, I'm not always thinking about how, it's, how it accumulates, but when I have a bunch. And, mm. and in this case, I had, I had a bunch. I had a few more than, than is in the, the book, but I, I, I suddenly realized that together, they, they form something. And, and sometimes you could have a lot of stories, but you think either there's something repetitive about a couple of them, and you feel like I'm still not at a book yet. But there, there was a moment with this, where actually the, the three stories in the book that I wrote um, after I had thought, oh, I, you know, this could be eventually a book, and then I started writing with that framing. So you can, so you'll work on a novel and stories at, at the same time simultaneously. Yeah, I, um, yeah. I mean, if I'm stuck in the novel, I, you know, I'll try to find something else to do. I'll do some nonfiction, or I'll do, I'll do stories, and and sometimes it helps, like having completed something, to 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 give you a little bit of confidence to go back to the to the beast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what what else do you do when you're stuck? Do you have other tricks? Um, I used to, when I was, uh, when I didn't have little kids, I used to, I would go to the movies and watch movies back to back because mm -hmm. I felt like I was putting experience between what I was writing. You know, I was putting stories between me and it. Right. And then I would go back and, and one of them, and, and of course reading, you read other, other people. And sometimes you read, um, sometimes I'll read books that seem to have had an easier time solving the problem that I have, whether it's time or, you know, so that helps a lot also, also reading. Do you ever have a story that you just can't finish, you can't execute you know, to your own satisfaction? Does that happen to you at all? Oh, a lot. I have yeah. quite a few of those. Um, but that's the thing that comes also with having done this a few more times. And mm -hmm. you, you, you feel like, you know, it's going to be there when it's ready. And, and a lot of those stories you can sometimes you know, merge, and sometimes they're like, oh, this wants to be in, and, and like, it might be three you know, pieces that become one or something like that. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting that you started with books that were connected stories, or that was the idea of them, and overlapping characters. But the connection's really through you, you know, through the writer, I'm finding that that's less of a fad now maybe than it was before and that the disparate stories still can sometimes find a unity. Mm -hmm. uh, did you when, when you, when you're putting it together, do you think about that when you put the stories in order? Do you think about you know, how they flow and giving the book a shape? I think, I mean, I think there's probably, that's, I, I say that to people too. I said, well, they're written by the same person. Right. <laughs> of course, you're, you're going to see certain certain patterns, um, but it's it depends on how much in terms of the you know connectivity, like how much sing the independence you want to give some of the like some of the characters, right? right. Like, and and there there are times when I felt like I was cute about it, like you have someone drive by a place where <laughs> like. Where, where the, the other story happened, and right, it's like, right. there's a sign that maybe they're driving by at the same time. You know, you have to keep yourself playful sometimes in this. Um, but I think as I, you know, I think the older I get, the more, the more like I resist that. I try to resist that. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our second finalist is Kelly Fajardo Anstein, whose story collection, Sabrina and Karina, represents an auspicious and audacious debut. If you've never spent time in Denver and Southern Colorado, you'll felt like you have by the time you finish this book, or you'll feel like you have. And you'll have seen those places through the eyes of some of its most longstanding inhabitants, providing perspectives that might be new to many readers, but ring very true. I'm pleased to introduce Callie Fajardo Anstein.
Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you to the Story Prize for honoring my collection as a finalist. Um, it is such a deep honor to be a finalist among Edwidge and Zadie, two writers whose work I have studied, who have inspired me, who have taught me. Um, so yeah, thank you guys. Um, I'm going to read from the title story, Sabrina and Corina. Um, for those of you who have not read the collection, uh, what you need to know is that uh, Karina is a makeup artist at the Cherry Creek Mall in Denver, Colorado, um, and her her best friend, her closest cousin, Sabrina, has been strangled to death at the beginning of the story, and Karina has been asked by the family if she will do the makeup for the funeral. We were inseparable in high school. Sabrina was my best friend, my closest cousin. My father, he would give me a hard time, ask if I ever tired of carrying her dead weight. But Sabrina was fun. She was vivid and felt everything deeply, from heartbreak to the drunken nights we stayed up until 4 a.m., mapping out our tiny lives with enormity only Sabrina could imagine. To her, everything was possible. Money, true love, a way out of Colorado. Even after she dropped out in 11th grade to work at a sports bar downtown, I used to do homework in a back booth, marveling at the way she glided between the tables, sleek and fluid with her long hair curled around her elegant neck. Men would follow her between their bites of onion rings and beer-battered fish, insatiable, as if my cousin were just another symptom of their hunger. After graduation, my father offered to pay for cosmetology school. He said that I needed to do something besides run around like other Cordova women. He mostly met Sabrina, of course, who by that point had started showing up to family dinners smelling like a barroom floor. But it wasn't just her. There was the distant niece whose infant son was taken away by the state, the cousins who died messing around with heroin, great Auntie Doty left blind after a date with the wrong man, and Auntie Liz, found dead in her Chrysler, the motor running, the garage door locked. My grandmother hardly mentioned Auntie Liz except to say what had killed her had killed them all. While I was studying cuts and colors, perms and relaxers, Sabrina continued working in bars and sleeping with men who all looked alike. Tall, thick-necked, green eyes, or blue. In my mind, these men formed a lineup of indifferent masculine faces, a continuation of the withdrawn expression I had seen in those old photographs of Sabrina's father. Sometimes, she'd visit me at the beauty college. She would stand at my station in her wrinkled clothes, looking like she'd just woken up at noon. While the other girls snickered and popped their gum, Sabrina would scoop away her hair, and I'd see the bruises, hickeys like rotten goose eggs down her throat. They'll send me home from work, she'd say, and I always helped her conceal everything. After finishing beauty school, I rented a studio apartment on the west side that overlooked an abandoned public pool. At night, on my second floor balcony, I'd sit and wonder about the missing diving board, replaced with an orange traffic cone, as if that could stop someone from leaping headlong into hard cement. It was a lonely place, and Sabrina only visited during the rare times when she was single. She'd come over and shadow me throughout the apartment, like a child who was afraid she'd stop existing if someone wasn't there to see her. You ever do makeovers on people who look hideous without makeup? Sabrina asked. She was sitting on the lid of my toilet with two Coronas between her thighs, one for each of us. We had the radio on an oldie station, the type of music our mothers played when we were little girls and they would drive us through the mountains in the summertime. Sure. I said, smiling, but after I fix them up, nobody can tell. I guess they can, Sabrina said, checking her reflection in the mirror, smudging her berry lip liner with her left pinky, and of course, you. We went to a bar that night on the edge of the city near a highway overpass. Neon signs hung in the foggy windows. We played a couple games of pool and drank shots of cheap tequila, and every now and then Sabrina danced over to the old school jukebox and flipped through the records, the light flickering over her face, her reflection a floating bust on the glass. I sat at the bar and watched a group of men circle around her. They held their beers close to their chest, and they waited for an opportunity to move in like vultures. We're going outside for a cigarette, Sabrina said. 
Two pale-faced guys with those broad shoulders and thick necks stood behind her, nervously casting gazes my way, as if afraid I'd ruin their fun. But you don't smoke, I said. I picked it up, she said, just now. I watched through the front window as she stepped outside and flopped against a parked minivan, twisting her hair around her fingers, her smile all teeth. The men stood next to her, packing their smokes. Neither was in her league, but Sabrina had a way of talking to men like she was a gift, an offering of an expressive pretty face and a girlish giggle. It didn't matter who it was, as long as they gave her attention back. And after a while, I couldn't watch it anymore. I swiveled around on my stool and I tried to catch the bartender's attention. He eventually came by, a white washcloth over his shoulder. That your sister, he asked, glancing out the window. Not my sister, I said. And I looked at Sabrina, tossing her hair back, the cords of her neck forming a chute to her collarbones. She's my cousin, I said. I knew you two were related. He poured tequila and set it before me. You look similar. Not really, I said, and swallowed my shot. When Sabrina hobbled back inside, she could hardly stand in her wedge platforms. The men guided her by the wrist while she swayed between them until they released their grips and Sabrina leaned over me, her perfume gone rancid with hints of rotten fruit, something that belongs in the trash. Karina, Karina, she said, having fun. I glared at the two guys beside her. They were far less drunk than Sabrina and beaming with pride as if they had already gotten her into a cab headed for one of their apartments. Let's get going, I said. Sabrina squinted at me. You can leave me here, she said. I'll get home okay. With my hands firmly around her wrist, I towed her to the front door. The two men laughed, backed off, and began to circle another girl a few stools down. The bartender pulled the white washcloth over the bar, eyeing the two of us while we left with what I thought was pity. Let's go, I said again. And outside the air was cool, the moon surrounded by a thin cloud, and I kept dragging Sabrina to the car as she tottered behind me. Don't you care how people look at you, I said. And when I finally let her go, she steadied herself against my trunk, opening her blue eyes wide. They look at us the same way, Karina. She laughed and pointed at my face. They look at us like we're nothing. I told her to get into the car. I said that she was drunk. And as we drove home, I glanced at her worn out face resting against the window. And I felt something unknowable about Sabrina, some sadness at her core that moved between us like a sickness. Where did it come from? Or had it always been there, growing inside her, filling her lungs with its liquid weight? Sabrina, I whispered, tapping her shoulder, but she was already asleep. And for the first time in my life, I miss someone sitting right beside me. Thank you. Thanks for that. Thank you. I noticed in uh, several of the stories like this, there seem to be pairs yeah. of women. Is that something you just noticed you were doing, or is that something that you set out to do? So this book began when I was in my very early 20s. Um, I was a student, so I didn't really set out to do anything. I didn't really mm -hmm. know what I was doing. I was finding my way through the stories. And it revealed itself to me pretty early on that I was sort of interested in the idea of like a dark double or the shadow self. Um, and they just kept popping up over and over again. And once I noticed that I was doing it unconsciously, I was able to sort of um, manipulate it and bring it up or bring it down. Um, but yeah, it was something that was accidental in the beginning. Is that something you've seen in other work you've read? Did you? No, I, I mean, I think. In order to have tension in a scene, you usually need to have two different conflicting points. Right. So I think it's in everything we read. It's in all the scenes of movies, plays. I mean, unless it's like a really long internal monologue. Um, but sometimes when I'm stuck um, and I'm working on a story or drafting, 
I've actually split characters in half. Mm -hmm. um, so for my, my novel that I've been working on for a number of years, the protagonist was one character, and then after maybe five years of working on it, I said, oh, sh she's two people, <laughs> and I split her up. So yeah, it's, it's something that I, I'm just really drawn to. You've been, so you've been working on these stories for 10 years, I think I saw, before the book came out? Yeah, yeah. a long well, time. <laughs> and what was the development? How did you, you know, move, because this is a debut, I think it's interesting, how did you move from you know, wanting to write and having things you wanted to write about to teaching yourself how to execute, how to write a good story? Yeah, it's, so it's sort of a long, it's a long story, but it's also, it's not that long because I only wanted to be one thing. I wanted to be a writer my entire life. And I mean, there was a moment where I wanted to be like a country star, but I can't say, <laughs> so it's not gonna happen. Um, but I, um, I, was a, I was a huge reader as a child, and so I was just consuming, consuming, and then by the time I was 15, I got a job at an independent bookstore in Denver called Westside Books, and I was selling rare and antiquarian books, and that's really where my education began, was in the bookstore. Mm. So all the clerks that I worked with, the owner, everybody was like, hey, have you read Catherine Ann Porter? And so when I showed up to college, I, I was like, I've read these, you know, these great works by all these dead people that you don't know about, guys. Right. <laughs> um, and then I think really when I was in college, I started to understand that we were not in very many books. And when I say we, I mean Chicanas who are mixed, who are from the Southwest, who have been there forever. And it really became my ambition to put us into books, to put us into more books. And that slowly sort of like took over. And when I got to graduate school, I mean, it, I don't think very many writers have the ambition to provide representation, but I was, I was just so upset and mad that we weren't in books. So that's, that's where the beginnings came from. And so how did you build stories around that? Did, were there stories you just knew, you heard from knowing people, or were you more you know, inventing? I was, I think I was doing a combination. Um, so I started off journaling as a child, but I got in trouble because my mom found my journals. <laughs> and she was like, what, are, you're so depressed. Like, what is wrong with you? And I was like, oh, I better not tell the truth anymore. <laughs> and so I started inventing characters that could sort of hold a lot of my sadness and a lot of things I was trying to work out. Um, so yeah, a lot of the stories in Sabrina and Karina, they come from my real life, but they're composites. They're not in any way just straight nonfiction. Um, for example, in Sabrina and Karina, uh, there was a girl I knew that had um, been killed when she was in her early, her early teens, and I, I just always remember seeing her and seeing the body. And also around that time, I think I had seen an image of Selena in the morgue. And that's not something any child should be seeing, but those images really haunted me. And so to just be able to pull those out later in life and try to understand, like, where is this haunting coming from and why isn't it going away? Right. And a lot of it is about being seen, right, and how people are seen. I think that's another element of all the stories that seems pretty prominent. Not a question. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> but, uh, a, that's really interesting. Yeah, the, like the mirror scene in Sabrina and Karina when they're looking at themselves and all the different mirrors. I, I mean, I spent a lot of my life feeling invisible. Um, I wasn't on TV. I wasn't in commercials. I wasn't in advertisements. I mean, it was, I was always a certain kind of family and a certain kind of class from a certain part of America that wasn't where I was from. And so I just, I really wanted us to be more prominent. Are you seeing, since you've done this, have you discovered more people doing the same thing or do you feel like it's, just, no, I, just the beginning <laughs> for this kind of representation. Um, I don't think it's the beginning. I think there's a lot, there are a lot of writers like me who are writing but haven't gotten published yet. So I'm sure that there, there's some more coming and I'm hoping that the publishing industry will support that. Um, but I hope that there's no one just like me. I hope that yeah. there's a bunch of us who are very distinct right, that, are, that are coming. But yeah, I, I haven't seen that many because I've been locked away in rooms writing. But <laughs> right. um, hopefully I'll get out and find some more soon. How was it hard for you to learn how to take this idea and the ambition and then to break it out into different stories? And were you always thinking in terms of stories or were you thinking of other ways of, of expressing that? 
So to begin as a writer, I thought, you know, what writers write their novels. That's what we write. And I just, I didn't have the skill set. Mm -hmm. um, so I had tried to tackle this multi-generational huge novel, but I was like 19 years old and like there's no way it was going to work. And when I got to graduate school at the University of Wyoming where I got my MFA, I was suddenly studying with writers like Joy Williams and Brad Watson and Allison Hagee. <laughs> And they were like, hey, by the way, we have only like an hour or two in workshops, so we're not going to be able to work on a whole novel. You should try writing stories. Mm. And, um, and they were giving me writers like Alice Munro and Edward P. Jones. And I think that's where I really discovered that I like the novel form, but I also really love the short story form. And I wanted to be able to work on both at the same time. Um, but I think for this particular book, because I was interested in sort of teasing out what it means to come from a place. Um, the short story form is really good at being, um, allowing me the ability to like sort of walk around in different sections of that place and give a wider variety of the community than, I mean, a novel. I mean, I just, I couldn't do it yet. Hmm. Do you have people that you show your stories to before you yeah. declare them finished that give you feedback, that help you out? Yes, and I think people might be surprised, but my number one reader is my little sister, Piper. Mm -hmm. And Piper is 22 years old right now, so she was reading my work when she was about 12. And <laughs> um, she's just a brilliant, sharp reader, and she gives really honest feedback. Um, I just finished a new story, and Piper was the first reader, and my agent, Julia, was second. So, <laughs> yes. Is Piper interested in writing, or she's just... Uh... I a great reader. I think she'd make a great agent. Um, no, she's, uh, <laughs> she's um, in law school right now. And I actually, I really, I want her to write because she's got such a perceptive eye and she's able to pull things out. And yeah, look inside your own families for your readers. They're, they're usually They'll tell you the truth, right? <laughs> yeah, they will. Yeah. Or not, sometimes. <laughs> Mine are pretty truthful people. I don't know. They're like, this sucks. Don't show this to anybody ever again. Yeah. What, what, what tendencies do you have that you think... Um, other people can help you rein in? Well, I've, I've discovered that I use the term smelled of very, mm. very much. So <laughs> that is one tendency that everybody, my editor, Nicole, my agent, everyone's like really reeled that in for me. Um, but yeah, I think, <laughs> I think some of my tendencies were just, I like lyrical prose mm -hmm. and that I could go overboard with that. And so, it was something that in the beginning I was like, oh, this feels so decadent and so nice to have this musicality. But I started to realize it was getting in, in the way of the story. And I wanted the story to speak louder than that. So um, yeah, just being reeled in with those, those lyrical moments, the lyricism, and you know, just allowing the story to show itself. I, I did hear, and actually I, I noticed when I read it, but you do mention characters and other stories in this story, like the uh, aunt who lost her sight. So there are these connections because it's similar turf. Mm -hmm. And are, are there other overlaps between them? Are there characters that appear? I, I didn't really yeah. catch that. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty slight. And one of the reasons, you know, the publishing industry really wants us to write novels. So one of the things that, that often will happen is that we'll, we'll write these short story collections and then they'll be a novel and stories or something, and then we're supposed to connect them. <laughs> so I was kind of aware of that, but I really, I, I fought against it because I don't think, I was like, these are, these are individual stories. But what I did realize about them is that they're individual stories of a community. And the way that my community naturally functions is that I can meet somebody who has a last name that I've heard of, and then as we start to have a conversation, I realize that they were my great grandmother's niece's nephew, mm -hmm. godson. So the, <laughs> so the kinds of connections I wanted to show up in the, the book were just the natural connections of how it feels. I wanted it to be realism. Um, so Dodie shows up because naturally, I think these characters would know each other. Mm -hmm. They might not be completely related, but definitely someone's cousin has worked on someone else's car or some, you know, <laughs> someone's done someone's nails or done their makeup. But yeah, it's, they're all part of this Denver Chicano community. Is it still like that? Yeah, I think it's, it's like that in some ways, but also because of gentrification, we've, we've been pushed all over to different sections of mm -hmm. the suburbs and different parts of the city. Um, but yeah, if we go to like the Chicano art gallery, everybody's going to know each other, everyone's going to hug, and we're all cousins and friends. But we really have to seek out those spaces now because our neighborhoods have been stripped of us. Mm. 
That's a shame. Yeah. You also write about a, a town in southern Colorado that's a fictionalized town. What made you decide to have a fictionalized town? You know, Denver's Denver, but you also have this other town that you've kind of invented. What, what was the advantage for you of doing that? Yeah, well, I thought I was a regular Faulkner. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. when I, I think my imagination was just naturally going toward the homeland, which is southern Colorado, where many of my ancestors left northern New Mexico and southern Colorado, and they migrated to Denver in the 1930s. Um, and so that space really loomed largely in my imagination, but I hadn't spent very much time there because mm -hmm. we left. Um, and so when I started writing, it just sort of naturally was occurring. But then I realized, I don't know this place the way that somebody who's from there living today would know it. And I didn't think it would be respectful to write about a place I didn't know. But then I also realized the place that my ancestors came from doesn't exist anymore. It existed in a timeline. Um, so I really wanted to give myself the leeway to move around in that space and to imagine that space without being held to some standard of what is historical fact, but of course, what is historical fact? I mean, we right. don't really know sometimes. Some of the stories are set in that earlier period. Did you have to do research on that? And, and how did you approach that writing about? I think, I don't know, it's one of the stories, the one about. Sisters. Yeah. 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 So sisters came um, naturally from a few different areas in my life. Um, I mean, the basic, the basic gist of it is that it was, a, it was an inherited trauma story. I mean, mm -hmm. there, there was a story of one of my aunties who was blinded, and I was told that story over and over again since I was a little girl. And it really surprised me. I remember I was in my apartment in Laramie, Wyoming. It was like this 1890s ex-brothel or something. And suddenly this voice was just appearing to me. And I made a voice memo on my iPhone. And when I played it back, it sounded really creepy. And it wasn't me. <laughs> um, but it was my Aunt Dodie, essentially. And so I really thought, OK, like something's coming through that wants to talk. And so I started writing it. And I was like, I don't know anything about the 1950s right. in Denver. So then that's when I started to do research. Um, I started looking at clothing and different neighborhoods where people would live. Um, and I started looking at cold cases of murdered girls in the city. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just interested in you know, what kinds of justices were actually enacted for these kinds of women. And that's where I realized, like, no, not very much justice at all. So yeah, um, my research has been something that I'm, I'm really fascinated by, though. What other things have you done in terms of research? Yeah, I, um, I visit vintage clothing shops, and I ask them, can you give me some miners overalls? <laughs> I, <laughs> I drive all over to these dusty towns throughout the Southwest, um, a lot of old newspapers. I've looked at wedding dresses from the 1920s. I've looked at sewing patterns. Um, because what I'm finding, we are not necessarily in the official archives when it comes to oral stories, um, photographs, newspaper clippings, but our clothing and certain things I can piece together. Mm. So one of my ambitions as a writer, I want to be able to get our artifacts into these official archives so other people like me can do research and then create more work from it. Thank you very much. Yeah, very thank you, Larry. Our third finalist is Zadie Smith, an outstanding novelist and essayist whose story collection, Grand Union, is her first and represents a different kind of debut. The stories in this collection are wide-ranging, bold, in some cases experimental, sometimes funny, and sometimes disturbing. But the skill, confidence, and brilliance of the writer shines through them all. These stories have the unique, and I would have thought incompatible, feeling of being both timely, <clears throat> timely and timeless. I'm pleased to introduce Zadie Smith. Hi, thank you, Larry. Um, I'm, kind of, I'm new to the short story game, so um, it's very nice to be with a long-standing star of the short story game and a new star of the short story game. I'm very pleased 
to be in this company. Um, I'm going to read a whole story, but it's short. Um, it's called Two Men Arrive in a Village. Um, and uh, when I write, wrote it, I was thinking about the fact that I hardly ever write violence, really. And I th wondered why I didn't. And I thought maybe because the moment you create violence in a story, the reader is always free to say, oh, well, that's what those people do. That's not what we do, that's what those people do. So I was thinking about it and I thought, could I write a story uh, about all people in all countries at all times? Um, and this was a kind of experimental shot at that. Two men arrive in a village. Sometimes on horseback, sometimes by foot, in a car or astride motorbikes, occasionally in a tank, having strayed far from the main phalanx and every now and then from above in helicopters. But if we look at the largest possible picture, the longest view, we must admit that it is by foot that they have mostly come. And so in this sense, at least, our example is representative. In fact, it has the perfection of parable. Two men arrive in a village by foot and always a village, never a town. If two men arrive in a town, they will obviously arrive with more men and far more in the way of supplies. That's simple common sense. But when two men arrive in a village, their only tools may be their own dark or light hands, depending, though most often they will have in these hands a blade of some kind, a spear, a long sword, a dagger, a flick knife, a machete, or just a couple of old rusty razors. Sometimes a gun. It has depended and continues to depend. What we can say with surety is that when these two men arrived in the village, we spotted them at once at the horizon point where the long road that leads to the next village meets the setting sun. And we understood what they meant by coming at this time. Sunset has historically been a good time for the two men wherever they've arrived, for at sunset we are all still together. The women are only just back from the desert, or the farms, or the city offices, or the icy mountains. The children are playing in dust near the chickens or in the communal garden outside the towering apartment block. The boys are lying in the shade of cashew trees, seeking relief from the terrible heat if they are not in a far colder country, tagging the underside of a railway bridge. And most important, perhaps, the teenage girls are out in front of their huts or houses, wearing their jeans or their saris or their veils or their lycra mini skirts, cleaning or preparing food or grinding meat or texting on their phones, depending. And the able-bodied men are not yet back from wherever they have been. Night too has its advantages and no one can deny that the two men have arrived in the middle of the night on horseback or barefoot or clinging to each other on a Suzuki scooter or riding atop a commandeered government jeep, therefore taking advantage of the element of surprise. But darkness also has its disadvantages. And because the two men always arrive in villages and never in towns, if they come by night, they're almost always met with absolute darkness, no matter where in the world or their long history you may come across them. And in such darkness, you cannot be exactly sure whose ankle it is you have hold of, a crone, a wife, or a girl in the first flush of youth. It goes without saying that one of the men is tall, rather handsome in a vulgar way, a little dim and vicious, while the other man is shorter, weasel-faced and sly. This short, sly man leaned on the Coca-Cola hoarding that marked the entrance to the village and raised a hand in friendly greeting, while his companion took the small stick that he had up to that point been chewing, threw it on the ground and smiled. They could just as well have been leaning on a lamppost and chewing gum, and the smell of borscht could have been in the air, but in our village we do not make borscht. We eat couscous and tilefish, and that was the smell in the air, tilefish which even to this day we can hardly bear to smell because it reminds us of the day the two men arrived in the village. The tall one raised his hand in friendly greeting, at which moment the cousin of the wife of the chief, who happened to be crossing the long road that leads to the next village, felt she had no choice but to stop opposite the tall man, his machete glorious in the sun, and raise her hand, though her whole arm shook as she did so. The two men liked to arrive in this manner with a more or less friendly greeting, and this might remind us of the fact that all humans, no matter what they do, like very much to be liked, even if it's only for an hour or so before they're feared or hated. 
Or maybe it would be better to say that they like the fear that they inspire to be leavened with other things, such as desire or curiosity, even if in the final analysis, fear is always the greater part of what they want. Food is cooked for them. We offer to make them food or else they demand it, depending. At other times, on the 14th floor of a derelict apartment building covered in snow, in which a village lives vertically, the two men will squeeze onto a family sofa in front of their television and watch the new government's broadcast, the new government they've just established by coup. And the two men will laugh at their new leader marching up and down the parade ground in that stupid hat. And as they laugh, they'll hold the oldest girl watching television by her shoulder in a supposedly comradely manner, but a little too tightly, while she weeps. Aren't we friends? The tall, dim man will ask her. Aren't we all friends here? This is one way they arrive, although they did not arrive that way here. We have no televisions here and no snow and have never lived above the level of the ground. And yet the effect was the same, the dread stillness and anticipation. Another girl, younger, brought the plates of food for the two men, or as is the custom in our village, the single bowl. This is good shit, the tall, handsome, stupid one said, scooping up tilefish with his dirty fingers, and the little sly one with the face of a rat said, ah, my mother used to make it like this, God rest her shitty old soul. And as they ate, they bounced a girl each on their laps while the older women pressed themselves against the compound walls and wept. After eating and drinking, if it is a village in which alcohol is permitted, the two men will take a walk around to see what is to be seen. This is the time of stealing. The two men will always steal things, though for some reason they do not like to use this word, and as they reach out for your watch or cigarettes or wallet or phone or daughter, the short one in particular will say solemn things like, thank you for your gift, or we appreciate the sacrifice you're making for the cause. Though this will set the tall one laughing and thus ruin whatever dignified effect the short one was trying to achieve. At some point, as they move from home to home, taking whatever they please, a brave boy will leap out from behind his mother's skirts and try to overpower the short, sly man. In our village, this boy was a 14-year-old we all used to call King Frog, owing to the fact that once, when he was four or five years old, somebody asked him who had the most power in our village, and he pointed to a big, ugly toad in the yard and said, him, King Frog. And when asked why, I explained, because even my father's afraid of him. At 14, he was brave, but reckless, which was why his wide-hipped mother had thought to tuck him behind her skirts as if he were a baby. But there is such a thing as physical courage, real, persistent, very hard to explain, existing in tiny pockets here, there, and everywhere, and though almost always useless, it is still something you don't easily forget once you've seen it, like a very beautiful face or a giant mountain range. It sets a limit somehow on your own hopes for yourself. And sensing this maybe, the tall dim one raised his gleaming machete and with the same fluid yet effortless gesture with which you might take the head off a flower, separated the boy from his life. Once blood has been shed, especially such a quantity of blood, a kind of wildness descends, a bloody chaos into which all the formal gestures of welcome and food and threat seem instantly to dissolve. More drink is generally taken at this point and what's strange is that the old men in the village, who, though men, have no defence, will often now grab at the bottle themselves, drinking deeply and weeping. For you need courage not only to commit bloody chaos, but also to sit by and watch it happen. But the women, how proud we are in retrospect of our women who stood in formation, arms linked the one to the next in a ring around our girls as the tall, dim man became agitated and spat on the floor. What's wrong with these bitches? Waiting is over any longer and I'll be too drunk. And the short sly one stroked the face of the chief's wife's cousin. The chief's wife was in the next village visiting family and spoke in low conspiratorial tones of the coming babies of the revolution. We understand that women stood so in ancient times beside white stone and blue seas and more recently in the villages of the elephant god and in many other places old and new. Still, there was something especially moving about the pointless courage of our women at that moment, though it could not keep two men from arriving in the village and doing their worst. It never has and never will. And yet there came that brief moment when the tall, dim one seemed cowed and unsure, as if the woman now spitting at him were his own mother, which passed soon enough when the short, sly one kicked the spitting woman in her groin and the formation broke and bloody chaos found no more obstruction 
to its usual plans. The next day, the story of what happened is retold in partial broken versions that change depending very much on who is asking. A soldier, a husband, a woman with a clipboard, a morbidly curious visitor from the next village, or the chief's wife returned from her sister-in-law's compound. Most will put a great emphasis on certain questions. Who were they? Who were these men? What were their names? What language did they speak? What marks were on their hands and faces? But in our village, we are very fortunate to have no rigid bureaucrats, but instead the chief's wife, who is, when all's said and done, more of a chief to us than the chief has ever been. She is tall and handsome and sly and courageous. She believes in the Gar Haramata, that wind which blows here hot, here cold, depending, and which everybody breathes in. You cannot help but breathe it in, though only some will breathe it out in bloody chaos. For her, such people become nothing more than Gar Haramata. They lose themselves, their names and faces, and can no longer claim merely to bring the whirlwind. They are that wind. This is, of course, a metaphor. But she lives by it. She went straight to the girls and asked for their account and found one who, encouraged by the sympathetic manner of the chief's wife, told her story in full. The end of which was the most strange, for the short, sly one had thought himself in love and afterward, laying his sweaty hand, head on this girl's bare chest, had told her that he too was an orphan, though it was harder for him, for he had been an orphan for many years rather than mere hours, and that he had a name and a life and was not just a monster, but a boy who had suffered as all men suffer and had seen horror and wanted now only to have babies with this girl from our village, many boy babies, strong and beautiful, and girls too, yes, why not girls? and live far from all villages and towns with this army of children encircling and protecting the couple all their days. He wanted me to know his name, the girl exclaimed, still stunned by the idea. He had no shame. He said he did not want to think that he had passed through my village, through my body, without anybody caring what he was called. It's probably not his real name, but he said his name was, but our chief's wife stood up suddenly, left the room and walked out into the yard. Thank you. I, I, that story has a really um, unique kind of movement from general to particular and general to particular. Right. Did you, um, was that organic? Did you um, set out to do it that way or did it? It's the only story I've ever written that I wrote in, um, you know, one shot. I mean, it's the only thing I've ever written in, in one mm. shot. Maybe, uh, I mean, my husband writes poetry, and I know sometimes poets write in one shot, but it's, it never happened to me before. So I, I was in a cafe in Calgary, of all places, um, and I had a gap between uh, a kind of lecture and a student thing, and, and the story just came to my mind, and I, I, I wrote it quite um, quickly. So I guess that, that, that is the definition of organic in that case. Hmm. Yeah, you used the word experimental for this, and I used it to introduce you. And I think um, it's an aspect of the collection that's really interesting. It seems like you're trying out a lot of different approaches to narrative. Yeah, I mean, I, I, but I think I feel very um, wary of experimental because hmm. it's, it's just not, um, I, I have such respect for the term. And I don't think my stories come anywhere near it. I, I think what, what interested me more, you know, I live in this neighborhood and I've lived here for about 10 years and I was thinking about the writers who lived here, um, people like Baldwin and Mary Baraka, Grace Paley, Donald Barthelme, and when I was reading their stuff, what struck me first of all was that these stories which seemed to me completely uh, wild, you know, formally and lots of other ways were regularly published in the New Yorker, were read, you know, really broadly by people, and, and I thought, if I gave my students some of these stories now, particularly someone like Barthelme, uh, they would be some deeply confused, you know, Renate, yeah. Renata Adler, all these extraordinary um, village folk who, would, who were doing some really kind of interesting stuff in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So that was part of the inspiration. I thought, if I'm going to live here, I should get to know what went on. <laughs> 
and this is the, you weren't really writing stories I mean, before this, were you, or? I, I, I mean, I never, as a young person, I never really wrote them unless it was a necessity. I mean, the first thing I ever published was a short story that my husband published in a college magazine. But it was only because that was the only way I could see to publish something. You know, I had no, uh, I had no knowledge of short stories. In England, uh, as a student at least, at least my generation, I don't remember ever being given one to read. Mm. Novels constantly, of course, so many novels, but no short stories. And it wasn't until I got to America, really, and came across these multiple organs in which you can publish them that I have started reading short stories and realizing you had a tradition of you know, masters of the short story. We have Somerset Moore. That's the beginning and end of our story <laughs> in, our, in our country. So I was, I was just amazed by it all. Mm. And then I, I started trying to write them. Um, I, I wrote a few for The New Yorker, but they were always like novels squished into, in, not very squished, in fact, like 25-page stories. So it, it took a long time to learn um, what a short story can do, yeah. And that's what you were exploring in the different approaches you were taking? Yeah, just different approaches, different voices, different perspectives, and um, part, partly for myself, partly, f I guess, slightly with my students in mind, like trying to remind myself and remind my students what's possible, right. what you can do in language, like th there's a lot of options. And it's, there's such a toolbox out there, it seems a shame just to exercise one tiny part of it. Another interesting thing is there's a lot of uh, philosophy and history and a lot of other kind of disciplines right. uh, that are wrapped up in that. Is, is that, again, something that... I don't, I, even when I was a kid, I always think anything that's, the way I give myself confidence is anything that's written down, I can understand it. If it's numbers, f forget it. Mm -hmm. but, if it's, <laughs> but if it's sentences, then it's available to me, it's open to me. And I, I always find that really exciting. So philosophy is a part of that. Like I'm not in any way formally trained, but I, I just had a feeling that if, if it's in prose, it's, it's somewhere in my world. Like I can read that like, <laughs> as, as something to do with me. So, so I do read quite a lot of philosophy, but very, in a very you know, amateur way. What do you think um, made you turn towards stories now at this point? Was there any? I just felt freedom doing them. And part mm -hmm. of it is definitely um, about time. And, and what Edwidge was saying about the satisfaction of a short thing, particularly when you have a family, can be quite frustrating trying to write very long things, which might be four, five, six years. And the story makes you feel better. I, I completely agree. If it's finished, you have a little boost of confidence, like, well, I can do things. <laughs> right. I can finish things. Can things finish can something. end. And I, f I really need that feeling, you know. And I, um, that, that's my version of, of tweeting or whatever. I get satisfaction out of <laughs> having done something. Yeah. Do you think you're going to continue to write stories, or do you not necessarily um, know? I, I just, this was an unusual thing, like I just mm. had a burst of energy and I wrote in a kind of intense way before my teaching started and I love doing it. Um, but, but I do have quite a lot of um, awe about short stories, like when they're, they're really great and I still f feel I have quite a lot to learn. Um, but, I, but I love doing it, it, w it was like um, remembering why writing is fun. You can forget that writing a novel, you know, you can, you can really forget. <laughs> Yeah, I think it felt, I think the fun, that you were having fun. Oh, I, well, at least through. I'm having fun. You know, the reader <laughs> here or there, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, it was, it was fun for me, too. Um, <laughs> it was good for me, too. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> I'm glad, Larry. You, you, have, um, you have a story in there that, um, about 9-11. Yes. And it's Michael Jackson, Marlon Brando, and Elizabeth Taylor yes. making their way out. Right. You know, I read that. The first time I didn't realize because you I know just a few people have names. told me that they have no idea who the people are, and I thought, what a bizarre story that must be. It's just three <laughs> random people stopping at McDonald's all the time. Um, yeah, no, it's those three. It, it, it's it's an urban myth, I guess. I mean, I I've only been able to trace it to one story in the Guardian. It was picked up in a few other outlets, like a, a two mm -hmm. or three years after the event. Um, but urban myths fascinate me because to me they're fiction writing by the people. They're they're collective. Right. Um, and they're quite beautiful in that way. Um, someone, one of my students was telling me about 
uh, is it called the Mandela effect? Like mass false memory syndrome? It's apparently a millennial matter. But um, he was explaining it to me. People who, groups of people who think they remember something, a TV episode or a historical event or someone dying and it not having happened. Um, Urban myths to me are like that, like a kind of creative act by many people simultaneously. There's something quite magical about them. Um, and I was just interested in the idea of uh, equality before pain. You know, I guess America is very hierarchical in its way mm -hmm. to do with money and fame and power. And, um, and I guess one of the things about cataclysms is this leveling instinct, to put it as most banal. Um, but I, I, I thought about those three people thinking of themselves and being asked to think of themselves as uh, extraordinary or special and that they might be the only people relieved for once to find themselves um, in the mass with humanity. Hmm. You mentioned that you live here, and, and uh, it seems like a lot of the stories are really centered around right. this particular neighborhood of this particular city. Yes, I mean, like, that surprised me, but I, the challenge with no offense to any Greenwich villages here, um, I love Greenwich Village, but it, of course it's, it, it's not, it's the kind of place where everyone's always telling you, you should have been here 50 years ago, right. or 70 years ago, <laughs> or 120 years ago, whatever it is. So it, it's the least, you know, it's the, the very definition of gentrification, and, and so there should be fundamentally nothing interesting about it. And, and I like that, uh, there's something challenging to me there about places which aren't cool or authentic or, you know, that interests me, that kind of place. So I found myself interested in it, that even though you know, supposedly the glory days are long in the distance. There's still something interesting about it, something mm. interesting to me, even if it's just the echo of the echo of the echo. Washington Square is a place which I c can never be bored by. It is infinitely uh, entertaining to me, yeah. Yeah, it actually really feels like a village. It does still feel like a village, even if it's a village of bankers, NYU <laughs> professors, and assorted yeah. la money launderers, but yes, <laughs> it, is. it is still a village, yeah. Not the kind of village two men are going to walk into. No, and, no, uh, we're very protected around here, yeah. Uh, <laughs> did, uh, I found a lot of the stories to be very funny. Oh, good. Um, <laughs> good, because if you said what? No, no, that's fine. <laughs> they're not meant to be funny. No, uh, I, I like funny. And yeah. is that something, you know, when you're writing something funny, do you make yourself laugh? Do you? Um, some, I mean, I, I, my brother's a comedian. There's a lot of that kind of thing in my family. I guess I'm sometimes aware of uh, a tension between wanting a laugh, which is my brother's business, um, and wanting something else. So in my writing, uh, I don't in any way look down on humor because it, to me it's like a saving grace. It's a kind of connecting. When I can't connect to it, someone in any other way, I can try that way, and that's mm -hmm. the way that usually works. Um, but I, I, when I'm talking to my brother about it, I think he feels the same way, that there are, there are different qualities of joke, right? There's cheap jokes, there's jokes which have a kind of depth to them and that resonate longer. So I, I just try when I'm writing to um, not, not to always go for the, the most obvious joke in front of me, though, though I'm a terrible ham, so it's often tempting. <laughs> yeah. Do you find that people totally miss that that there are jokes, that you are So I, I think funny. The, the, what comes with the idea of literary is, is seriousness, right? So people yeah. feel, I don't know how they sit down to read, but you imagine a very serious look on their face as they, <laughs> as they open the book. Um, but in this case, actually, I got my brother in the, for the audio book, um, not only because I couldn't be bothered, but that was part of it. I read the first story and the last story, and he read all the others. Um, and I haven't heard it yet, but I, I know that anything I tried to make serious, he would have ridiculed in the audiobook, so I'm sure it's funnier now even the when you listen to it. Even probably, the story you probably, just read? You can make anything funny, yeah. <laughs> even the one you just read? I hope not, but I'm going to yeah. have to listen to it. That we'll might see. be the least yeah. funny yeah. <laughs> story in the whole book. Yeah, this is not funny, it's true. How did you, uh, what were you thinking in terms of um, how you put it in, in order? How do you take a, you know, a, a collection of stories that are so different one from the other for the most part, and how do you, right. and, you know, create an order to it that you think makes And we had a sense. lot of arguments about it. I, um, I guess in my mind I realized that the, the structure of it, to me, is an album, particularly hip-hop albums, right, which always have too many songs on them and every one is completely different. That's somewhere, that's somewhere deep in my idea of the structure of, of a short story book. Um, but I, I had, I mean, I, I gave it to uh, 
Nick and friends and other writers, and there were definitely the opinion that you should leave all the crazy stories out or you should only leave the crazy stories in. Or, and e each of those interpretations has an ideal reader at the other end, I guess. Right. Right? Like readers, all readers being 27 or all readers. Like, so for, for me, I, I knew that they were right. Everybody's right. But, it, but not, in, not for <laughs> the kind of reader that I'm hoping for, I suppose, who, who is someone who doesn't mind to be pulled pillar to post. Um, and that's the kind of reader I am, I suppose. And so that's what I was hoping for. And I, I always had the feeling that if I left out certain stories, there's some person for whom that's the, that's the favorite story. And I just right. wanted to be there. Even if they hate everything else, I don't mind as long as, as le that story gets to them. So, so it's a bad aesthetic choice, probably. But I, I, that's how it ended up. So in a way, you're thinking um, you hope different people will find different things to like that's in it, it rather than that's it. one, you know, one way of reading it. One right, and, and one implied audience, um, which always, I, that's n never what I want. I, something about the variety is interesting to me. I learned a lot. I, um, there were a lot of references. I like to be I, educational. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, looked, I looked things up. Um, I did not know about Paul's Boutique. That, oh, yeah, that's yeah. a good album. Yeah. Early Beasties, Although yeah. the guy who is listening to it is not necessarily a, a good guy. Actually, actually, he was very um, yeah, I, he's, he's, um, magnetic in a way, but. Yeah, so I, I was thinking um, he's maybe one of my favorite characters. And he's a, he's a guy who smuggles himself into a university and uh, lives and, and work as if he's a student, but he isn't. <laughs> Which in the, in the 90s was a fairly common thing, right? Because there were no. There's no security in any of these colleges, right. no particular keys, no mobile phones. No, you know, anyone could <laughs> turn up and be a student. So it was a slightly wild time. But it was really, um, that was a fun character to write. Yeah. He, he turns out to be more popular than Yeah, more popular any than any student. Students. Yes, yeah. Um, I loved writing that. And that, that was a good example of, in shorter fiction, the f freedom you can have. It, it, that story goes through the present and the past almost every other paragraph. And in a novel, it's an exhausting matter. But in a short story, the length is everything. You can do things you couldn't do otherwise. You wouldn't tolerate for 300 pages, but a fine for 10. Were there things that you found you couldn't do that you were trying and you just didn't pull off to your satisfaction? Um, for, for me, uh, plot, I mean, plot in novels is, is so complicated. The thing I, I find hard is, um, uh, you know, the complete illusion. I, I love to read a story and not even notice it's being written, you know, just to feel uh, the reality of the thing. Mm -hmm. that, that kind of realism is, um, you know, often sniffed at, but, it, but if you ever try to do it, it's incredibly hard. Yeah, yeah. so that, that's something that I had little glimpses of in the collection, but it, it's hard to sustain. Yeah, so it's... Um, I guess, in a way, what you're, you're encountering another mind, in a way, when you read. Right. You are, Imagine. and um, it should be a balance. You, I mean, it, there's always, always a bullying element of writing. You're trying to force someone to see uh, things your way, mm. through your eyes, your vision, your sensibility. And, um, but I guess in short stories, at least for me, I found that there's so many ways to see that I found it quite freeing. And I felt less, um, less like a bully, because there's always a way out, a way out of this story into another. 400 pages is a long time to make someone. Uh, conform to your view of the world. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Those were three really uh, great readings and uh, wonderful conversations. So thank you to all three of our finalists for, for participating in this. Uh, now, Julie Lindsay. Yeah. And now, uh, Julie Lindsay, the founder of the Story Prize, will announce this year's winner. Tonight, we're celebrating the short story and the writers who create them. 
For many writers who have been on this stage over the years, the prize has provided them with the encouragement they needed to continue their work. Edwidge, Kali, and Zadie, those were beautiful readings and interviews tonight. We honor and celebrate your art. I think most people in this room are guessing as to who the winner will be based on the readings tonight. But in fact, the decision was made well before tonight by our judges, <laughs> who cast a vote solely on the basis of the merit of each collection. Our thanks goes to the judges who had the hard job of choosing the winner among the three really great collections. Two finalists this evening will take home a check of $5,000 and the winner will receive the prize check of $20,000. This year's winner, after 15 years, has come back to win again. <laughs> Congratulations to Ed Beach Danikat for everything inside. Wow, I'm really, really stunned. <laughs> wow. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, and thank you to the Lindsays. And um, sitting here listening to Kali and Zadie reminded me how much I love this form, how much I, I love these stories, and how much I love being part of, of this world and, and, um, and meeting people who create such wonderful work and who are traveling on this road with me. Um, I, I didn't write anything because I was like, they're not going to do this twice. <laughs> um, but I really, I, I have to thank some people who've also been actually on the road with me. 15 years ago, um, my friends uh, Taina and Patricia came with me. And, um, and, and Patricia was like, this is like the Academy Awards. <laughs> you find out there, you know, you found out there and they're back tonight again because they're, they're just, um, and, um, and Robin Desser, who is always among the first people who read my, who read my stories. And um, Robin is like, uh, this this type of editor that you really hate when you get those 50 pages of notes that she sends you <laughs> and then you're just like loving the rest of the time because she always um, keeps me from making a fool of myself so I love you so much Robin and Nicole who um, you know Nicole Oraji who has, has been on this journey with me so um, I'm ill-prepared and, and, and in shock, but I thank you all very much for caring about stories, for caring about gatherings like this, and for caring about writers like us, all three of us, really. Thank you so much. Thank you.